would like to welcome each of you here this evening on a beautiful Sunday night uh, to worship our Lord and Savior together. It's been such a privilege to be a part of these meetings. Um, this is Sunday evening, and I share with our congregation this morning that if you've missed the first few, there's good news, there's still more left to come to. And again, I would encourage each one of you to find and pray for somebody and invite them to these meetings this next 10 days. A lot of times we have social media and that's kind of what we rely on to get the word around, but there's nothing, nothing like a personal touch. And that is um, something that I have experienced this week so far already from our God and Savior and the Holy Spirit in my life, and it's exciting. And so I would ask that if you know of somebody that's, that, that, you would have, that God has brought, brought to your mind, go find them tomorrow or even tonight yet and call them on the way home and just invite them to a time of worshiping our Lord and Savior together. So to start this evening, shall we start with a word of prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. We're so thankful for this beautiful weather that you've given to us these first few nights of the tent meetings, Lord. But more importantly, I'm so thankful for the way your spirit has moved. Lord, I cannot help but know that heaven is going to look different because of what has taken place here already. Lord, I pray again for an infilling of your Holy Spirit into this tent, under these grounds. Lord, above all, I pray that you move in just a mighty way again this evening. And Lord, as we leave here and as we go out into our community, may we bless those that we come in contact like we have been blessed for being here. In your precious name I pray, amen. Good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Let's stand together, shall we? Yes, yes. How many of our desire is, uh, our desire is higher ground to press on the upward way? Can you lift your hands and give a wave offering tonight? P is it in? Where are we at? An A? F? Okay, an F, all right. That's good. A, B, C, D, F. F? I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Till facing as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on high. Here, let's sing now, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on Him. Will land a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled, my faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Oh, Lord, me up and let me stand my faith on heaven. To scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to high year. Now let's lift our voice, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven. Twenty years ago, teaching that song in Ghana, Africa, to the uh, Africans there, they'd never heard it. Oh, every morning at devotion, they wanted to sing "Hiya Guan, Hiya Guan." I said, "Okay, I'll sing Hiya Guan." All right, we're gonna sing "Jesus Loves Me." That's how they put the W on over there. Okay, all right, children, this is your turn, but we'll all sing. Jesus loves me, this side for the. 
Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates, he will wash away, oh, and let his little child come in now, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus loves me. Wonderful singing. Now, by the way, you uh, children, um, we are going to, after the service, there'll be suckers back there for you. And last night I was tied up, but totally forgot. But I don't know if it was Eugene, Kyle, Derek, or Grace, or who that got the suckers for the children last night. But thank you. So, children, back in the booth when we're done. Go back and help yourself. What key are we in? An A? All right. Well, here we go. Okay. Now. This is what God wants us to do, and it's happened all over the world, and the more fire that gets in our bosom through the Holy Spirit, this is what can happen. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining Jesus, the light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth you now bring us, shine on me, yes, Lord. Shine on me, shine, yes, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By thy blood I may enter your brightness. Try me, try me, consume all my darkness, shine on me, shine on me, and sing now, shine, fill this, play, spirit, play. grace and mercy send forth your word and Lord and let there be light. Give him glory. Give him grace. All right, thank you for uh, the singing. You guys may be seated. And uh, tonight for our uh, devotional, Brother George Gray from River of Life Church in Copenhagen is going to be sharing with us. And also, George has been doing all our internet stuff, and I think they deserve a round of applause for that. That's a big undertaking, and we appreciate it. So, Brother George. (laughs) That's just the way it goes. It's the story of my life, right? Let me ask you a question here. How many of you would like to walk in the peace that passes all understanding? Right? Now I gotta make this quick because I told me I only had five hours. (laughs) So one of the things that I love to do uh, that ministry allows you to do to spend a little time is uh, to dig into the Word of God and uh, eventually you become a word nerd. And a couple of years ago I was privileged enough to be able to spend some time at a school in uh, uh, online in Tel Aviv learning about the Hebrew language. 
And you, when you do that, you stumble across things that are just absolutely amazing. And one of the things you learn about language is that language is not just a series of words. We take language for, for granted. We think A has always been A and C has always been C. That's just not the case. When people are coming up with language and they're trying to figure out a written language, someone didn't, didn't say, I think we should start with an A and it should look like a triangle. What's a triangle? Well, let's see. It looks like an A, but it doesn't, it's, it, it doesn't work like that. You have to find a way of conveying ideas of truth using images. And that's what a written language is. And Hebrew is one of the oldest written languages on the earth. I think it's actually the oldest, but there's some debate there. I think they're wrong because God always wins. That's just the way it works. And so in the early parts of the Hebrew language and biblical Hebrew, the words, all the letters, have a meaning behind that letter. And the word that I spent the most time looking into was the word shalom. I don't know if it's up on the screen. I, I remember I got the, the picture there, but uh, there's, there's four Hebrew letters there. It's Shim, Lamed, Vav, and Mem. And all of those letters have a meaning behind them. And what would happen is when you're trying to come up with a, a word to express an idea, you use these pictures that you've already put together to help bring the idea out so everyone would understand what you're talking about. And when you look at the Hebrew word shalom, that first letter, Shim, means to destroy. Now remember, this is the Hebrew word for peace. That second letter is a shepherd's staff, and it means authority. The third letter is a nail, and it means to bind. And the last letter is mem, it's waves, it means chaos and confusion. And I want you to think about something. When you think about the word peace throughout the Bible, Paul uses it all the time, grace and peace to you. Jesus says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Now listen to this carefully, and then I'm going to tell you what the word peace really means in ancient Hebrew. He says, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. When you put all the letters of the word peace together, what it means is the destruction of the authority that has bound you to chaos and confusion. And Jesus says, my peace I give you, so do not be afraid. A lot of us think peace means the absence of conflict. No, it's not. It's a conflict properly managed. You look all through the Bible. When God sends his people into, the, into Canaan, he says, drive your enemy out before you leave nothing standing. You know why Israel had so, many tr so much trouble? They never found peace. They never eliminated the enemy. Boy, does that speak today. How much, how much of us have chaos and confusion in our life? It's because we haven't eliminated the enemy. We haven't found the peace that passes all understanding because we've allowed the enemy to stay alive. Jesus says, my peace I give you. Paul says, grace and peace be with you. In all of his writings, he says that. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. And peace we get is what allows us to get grace because Jesus stepped out of eternity into mortality and took our penalty on the cross. He has conquered the authority that had bound us to chaos and confusion. The battle is over. Why are we afraid of the devil? He's a toothless old dog. He's got nothing and he knows it. The question is, do you know it? We're allowed to have the grace that Paul talks about because of the peace that Jesus brought. Without the peace that Jesus brought, all we have is law. All we have is religion. All we have is a process. That was never Jesus' intention. Jesus' intention was to bring us the peace that passes all understanding. It passes the understanding because the battle has been won and the world doesn't get it until they have Jesus in their heart. So my friends, walk in the peace that passes all understanding. Be not afraid because Jesus has already won. He's already defeated everything you're afraid of. All you have to do is believe. Father, help us believe, help us to trust, and help us to walk in the confidence that the world doesn't understand. In your name, amen. Man, we might as well give the altar call and... Wow, no, I'm looking forward to more, but God bless you, Pastor George, for uh, that wonderful word. Again, as we shared, Brother George has been recording these for us, and you can buy a recording 
Um, it is available immediately following the service, or if you want to buy the whole set, you can sign up and receive the whole set on CD or flash drive. And uh, again, a reminder tomorrow, they'll start the noon prayer group again over here at the prayer tent uh, at, um, every day at noon. And so if you have time to come and to just uh, pray with, with people in prayer, and then if you can come into the tent and pray as long as you would like. And then again, there's invite people. Invite people. Invitation cards are available on the resource table. And um, I, again, I cannot just encourage you enough to invite people. Uh, that, that someday heaven can look different. And tonight we are going to be blessed uh, by the Millers and their singing, and so we'll turn this service over to them. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be And my sorrows, and he made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary, and suffered and died alone. We're singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall live. I at last shall see. Swill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Amen. I don't want to ever get over the simple fact of the gospel and what Christ did for us. That is something that as believers we can hold on to as truth and as the hope we have in Christ. Thank you all for being here with us this evening. We're honored that you would come and join us on a Sunday night. Who is this your first time here? Let me see your hands. First time here at the 10 meetings. Awesome. Well, we're great. It's great to have you here. Worship along with us. Immortal, you are not like a man that you change your mind. Or change your plan invisible our human eyes can't see the depths of your majesty you're the god of forever and ever all men the alpha omega beginning and end we sing hallelujah we worship in awe immortal invisible god immortal you are 
are not bound by death you're the living god my very breath invisible you are not bound by space but your glory is filling this place yes your glory is filling this place you're the god of forever and ever amen the alpha omega beginning and the we sing hallelujah we worship in awe immortal invisible god immortal yet you once died for me to pay my debt and to set me free invisible you will not always be cuz you're coming to reign as our king and the saints will fall down at your feet you're the god of forever and ever amen the alpha omega beginning and end we sing hallelujah we worship in our immortal invisible god we sing hallelujah we worship in our immortal invisible Yeah, so uh, we sang, I think, was it uh, Thursday night this past week? Okay, uh, and we did a little family introduction, but uh, not everyone was here Thursday night, so we may do a quick introduction. And uh, this is a sibling group up here that you see, and our parents are joining us now. Dad? All right. Well, we greet you tonight in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, it's such an honor to get to know you better throughout every evening. I try to, you know, make some contacts and get more acquainted with people, but uh, I don't, of course we don't get to everybody, but it is really by the grace of God we are who we are. And my wife, Ruth Ann, for, well, we celebrated uh, 30 years earlier this year by the grace of God, and we have five children, and the oldest daughter, as many of you are aware, is married. She lives in Napanee, Indiana, and any day we hope to get a phone call of our first grandchild being born, and uh, praise God. We are looking forward to that. And so, God may, may God have his way on the timing. Our oldest is Derek. He is uh, actually less than a week now, 28 years old, and then he'll be a year older. Uh, and Eugene is uh, 26 years old, and sometimes they introduce themselves, so when I do, I have to think of their names. Kyle is 20, I mean, their age, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't forget their names, yeah. Uh, 24 years old. And our youngest is Grace, and she is um, 18 years old. And we don't, my wife and I, um, we don't help with a lot of the music. We help a little bit on a few recordings, maybe one song or so, but we have plenty of other responsibilities, and we are very, very okay with that. I'm just privileged to run sound for them when they sing. And then I get to preach, of course, but we are so grateful. But we do help occasionally here on a song, and tonight this is one of our family songs, and our desire is that... Um, we not only do we give our life to Christ, but when Jesus saves us, he doesn't save us for us just to stay put, but to make a difference. And may we be encouraged with that tonight. There's a call going out across the land in every nation. A call to all who pledge allegiance to the cross of Christ. A call to true humility to live our lives responsibly, to deepen our devotion to the cross at any price. To love the Lord our God 
is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows across the street or around the world. The mission still the same, proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. Let us then be sober, moving only in the Spirit, as aliens and strangers in a hostile foreign land. The message we're proclaiming is repentance and forgiveness, the offer of salvation to a dying race of men. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows across the street or around the world. The mission still the same, proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name, to love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission the spring from which our service overflows across the street or around the world the mission still the same proclaim and live the truth in jesus name proclaim and live in Jesus name God bless you we had the privilege of being with the uh, Krogan uh, congregation this morning uh, with Pastor Paul and the leadership there. And um, uh, during their sharing time, I was challenged. There was a, a bunch of testimonies shared about uh, health and sickness and um, the recent passing of a, a newborn child. And uh, when we hear things like that, it, it's, it's hard to reckon with, God, how is, how is this possible in the life of a believer? Um, good people or whatever we'd want to say, like, how do bad things happen um, to people that we would say don't deserve it uh, whatsoever? And um, my mind goes to the fact that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what our experience in life is, God is still the same God. And he still has a plan and he's still sovereign and he still loves us more than anyone else on earth could ever love us. And uh, so this song says, I lift my eyes to heaven and remember where my help comes from. And it talks about questions I've never had to ask before, tears I've never had to cry before. And we've experienced something pretty drastic in our world in the last two to three years of questions and conversations and happenings that we've never had to deal with before. But we still serve a God that has the answers for today, and his word is still true today. And so think about that as we sing, Lift My Eyes. I've never asked these questions. I've never felt so broken, oh God. What do I do now? I've never cried this way. I've never seen such pain. Oh God, what do I do now? But even here, even now, I lift my eyes to heaven and Remember I am loved I lift these weary hands And let my Father pick me up More than answers More than healing God Your presence is enough I lift my eyes to heaven And remember you're still where my help comes from
All my fears came true, but they're no match for you. Oh God, come and hold me now and be my prince of peace. Share my suffering. Oh God, come and hold me now. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I am loved. I lift these weary hands and let my Father pick me up. More than answers, more than healing, God, your presence is enough. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember you're still where my help comes from. If you are near to the brokenhearted, then you are here with me. You take my sorrow inside your hands and you turn it to victory. If you are near to the brokenhearted, then you are here with me. You take my sorrow inside your hands and you turn it to victory. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I am loved. I lift these weary hands and let my Father pick me up. More than answers, more than healing, God, your presence is enough. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember you're still where my help comes from. You're still where my help comes from. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus for my life. Life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing all His mighty yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will sing. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. And through the deepest valley, He will lead. I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. For the future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated and jesus now and ever is my plea and all oh, the chains are released i can see 
you glad that it's Christ and not us? Wow. I often put that verse on if I sign something or whatever. Galatians 2.20. It's yet not I, but it's Christ that liveth in me. I kind of reminds me a lot of the Apostle Paul in Romans where what is a living sacrifice, a Living is something that's alive, and a sacrifice is something that is not. So how can you have a living death thing? <laughs> but Paul, I believe that's what he was referring to in Galatians 2.20. It's, it's, I'm crucified with Christ, but yet it's, it's not I, but it's Christ in me. And what an incredible, incredible blessing. Nelson, would you come? Again, I know uh, I don't believe you need much introduction here tonight, but... Um, Servant of God that has stepped out many years ago and has said yes to the call of Jesus Christ. And what God has raised up, only God could do. And we are so, so grateful. And so join me in praying tonight for the servant of the Lord. If you would just stretch your hands forward and we want to pray together. In fact, if you feel like just praying out loud right where you are, just, just feel free to do that. Just all over this tent. Just, just open. Let, let's just pray together. Shall we tonight? Father, yes, it is in the Jesus mighty name, name of Jesus, Jesus that we just Christ. come to your throne of grace, O oh God. God. We are asking, O oh God, for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost tonight. We pray, O oh God, that nothing would come through in the flesh in any way, shape, or form, but the fullness of your anointing, O oh God. The fullness of your anointing. Again, fresh wind, fresh fire. Father, that you would, Lord, you have spoken to Nelson throughout the, the hours, throughout the night hour, throughout the morning, throughout today. You have put a message on his heart, and I pray now that even as he speaks, that we would not even so much hear his voice, but we would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, it is amazing to me how you will take the message of God from your word, and you will take and interpret it through the interpretation of the Holy Spirit and minister it to every heart according to the need. And so we're asking, would you favor us with that here tonight so that we would not leave the same way we came? So we also want to remind the enemy that he has lost, as we already heard earlier. We plead the blood of Jesus over this tent, the surroundings, the grounds in Jesus' name. And we glorify you, Jesus, because you are the one who is worthy of it all. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen and amen. amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. By his grace and for his glory. Can the church say amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. The children. And uh, so good to see all the children that are here this evening. Young people. Saw some way in the back there. And they're going to be our amen section. I think it's about five, seven, eight young men in the back there. So we're calling them then to be the ameners. And, okay. And uh, that's great. So good to have all of you out that we can come worship the Lord. Now, I saw a couple of people that were kind of yawning tonight. They were coming in and probably just after afternoon naps and all kind of stuff, you know. 
One looked a little exhausted, mind me of the lady that dreamt about her muffler all night long and woke up exhausted. So anyhow, <laughs> I don't know if it was her or not. And then there was the lady back there. She was asking me a little bit about it. I think she's really new because she said, who's preaching? I said, my wife's husband. And she looked around to see where he is. And I said, well, she hadn't met him yet. So anyhow, so, so that be he. So we will, we will just uh, go from there. But isn't it wonderful to be able to come together and worship the Lord in this way and learn from the Lord and learn from one another? Oh, what a blessed evening God gave us again last night. I was on the phone with my sweetheart for a while and daughter Carolyn, and they kept texting back and uh, sharing and encouraging. It was just such a, uh, such a great blessing um, to, 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 to the glory of God. And uh, by the way, tomorrow evening, if you, if you enjoy harmonica, if you enjoy really good harmonica playing, you've heard some good harmonica players in country music, but there's going to be a gentleman here tomorrow night and Tuesday night one of the best harmonica players we have ever come across. And they play, he plays harmonica, plays piano, plays uh, guitar. And his wife, they have a number of recordings. And you're going to be in for a real treat uh, for the special singing. But talk about a real treat. Have these Miller children been a special treat? Woo! Whoa. What a blessing to the glory of God. I just, just so blessed. Not only the singing, but... They're just so, uh, they're so willing, so helpful. Uh, Derek's running a PowerPoint back there. Kyle, he's working on getting the CDs ready night after night. And Eugene's working on all the technical sound and all that stuff. They all have their part. And when you ask them to do something, they're always like, yes, yes, that's fine. That's fine. Yep, that's good, you know. And I should ask them something one time while they'll say, well, no. You know, but uh, anyhow. But thank you all so much for, for what you do. It really, really, it really is so meaningful. And uh, we thank God. And all you that are helping here, the ushers, car parkers, all the things that, that everybody does to make this. You know, teamwork uh, is what really makes it. Good friend that says teamwork makes the dream work. And uh, really, um, that is what happens. Uh, last evening, uh, and again, tonight, I'm sure there, there's a number of folk that were not here last evening. Uh, and tonight, I asked Derek to put that back up on the screen again, those four words. And it's the word that God takes a life from a mess to a miracle, to a message, to a ministry. And the mess I shared about last night was that uh, no matter what we say, well, that life was messier than that and so forth. But you know what? In the eyes of the Lord, there's a three-letter word that describes everything. What is it? Sin. He said, all of sin, Romans 3.23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Everyone is sin and have come short. We cannot attain without Jesus Christ. The next verse says... For the wages of sin is death, separation from God. Friend, if you don't know Christ is your Savior, you are separated from God. Not only physically, but also spiritually. If you would die in your sins, you would forever be separated from God. He said the wages of sin is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the greatest gift ever given. Is the gift of God that Jesus gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not what? But have what? Wow, you talk about assurance. He said, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you shall not perish, not go to hell. But you shall have everlasting life. The Bible says it goes on to say, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him may be saved. He wants to save us, deliver us, set us free. He's more eager to save us than we are to be saved. He is. He's more eager to set us free than we are to be set free. That's why he came is to unshackle, loose us, set us free so that our life can be taken from a mess to a miracle. The miracle is being born again, washed in the blood of Jesus because of Calvary and what Christ has done. Believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the miracle of redemption. And then the message is that God has saved me, delivered me, washed me, cleansed me with his precious blood. And I'm on the way to heaven. My name is in the book of life. That becomes ministry. Then you take the message and take it all over the world. Come on, church. Amen. Amen. And that's what God wants us to do. He says, I'll take you from a mess. I'll apply the miracle. It's called Jesus Christ and his blood. That is ministry taking place. Then he saves and redeems us. Now go out. And apply it in ministry. Become broken bread. 
and spiritual nourishment to the world wherever we go. That's the plan of God. One of the elements I think that, you know, at home we have water running through and down in our basement we have, uh, gets plugged up and we have to clean out the, uh, what do you call it, the filter so that it'll run again. It's got, the water's come dirty and sandy and sluggish. It won't come through. The flow isn't good. There's something there that I'm thinking about this evening that for our lives spiritually that will plug or clog the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through that it cannot go. It needs cleaning out, and it's, uh, and, and it's our heart. The psalmist David said, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. One of the things that clogs the heart the greatest, I believe, is the area of reconciliation and forgiveness. Now, last night we touched on it. The whole element of forgiveness, being reconciled to one another and unforgiveness, we touched on it last evening. But I'd like to share about it because I believe that is one of the greatest elements that will clog up the Holy Spirit, keep God from being able to move in our lives, that fruitfulness can come forth and the greater works that we so desire to do to the glory of God is when there's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness because relationships, when, when, when relationships are not proper, the power of God cannot flow properly. So let me just change it around. The power of God flows through proper relationships. Relationships with our families, with our friends, with our co-workers, those in church, uh, people that we're around, office, whatever it may be. But number one is to go vertical. Is our relationship with God where it needs to be? Do you know tonight, talked about the peace he was talking about. The peace of God. Do you have that peace? After I got saved, we're out ministering in a prison in uh, Arizona. And the prisoner said to me, sir, in one word, what would you say happened when you became a Christian? I said, peace. Peace. Yeah, I said, I never had peace with God. I didn't have peace with my parents. I didn't have peace with my friends. I didn't have peace with anybody. I was not at peace with the law. I was not at peace in my heart. But when Jesus Christ came in, I found the peace that I never experienced before. Hallelujah. Peace. It's the peace of God that passes, he said, all understanding. It's that peace of God. And I want to encourage us tonight. You can turn with me, if you will. Turn to Matthew 18. You're very familiar with this passage. But I guess to turn there, I don't have all the verses on PowerPoint here this evening. I have some of the verses there. Now I'm looking for my binoculars again. Where'd I put them? Okay, here yeah, I got a pair. About a 150 is what I'm needing. I'm not really in this. 200. Woohoo! <laughs> now I can see from back here, Dave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's good. Just kidding. Hey, thank you. All right. Hey, it's going to work. All right. <laughs> awesome. Give God a clap offering. Amen. Amen. Now, here, here in Matthew 18, we're going to just set the stage this evening and sharing about forgiveness. I'm going to share some illustrations here tonight. You know, in the world that we live in, uh, all over the world, now I find as I travel, no matter where you go, the possibility of being hurt, rejected, being misused, being abused, falsely accused. All of those things are possible all over the world. It's, it's people just like you and I. It's just a different culture, maybe even different color. But the same things. We were just over there in Africa. Some of the very same things. There, it's just on a different level uh, with different people. But that's the way it is all over the world. And you and I, we don't need to look. We don't need to look very far and look back. You know, for the first funeral was what? Back in Genesis, the very first funeral and when uh, the parents buried a son, when Cain kills Abel, and the hate, the violence, the anger, the jealousy, the rebellion, the grief, the sorrow, it was all there, very at the very beginning, when sin entered the heart of man. It began there, and it's still going today. And it will be until the day we go home to be with Jesus. And so it started back there, all these grief and the sorrow and so forth. But God has the answer. We're going to look at that here this evening. But here in... Um, in 18, chapter 18, and in verse 21, it says, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, uh, my brother, if a brother, uh, how often a brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times, Jesus said, I say unto you until seven times seven, till seventy times seven. So seven times seven, 490. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. When he had begun to reckon with them, he brought one unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. For inasmuch as he had to, not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife, children, all that so forth to be made payment for. 
The servant therefore fell down. He worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. Then I'll pay you everything. But then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. He loosed him and forgave him the entire debt. The same, in fact, the man knew that he never would be able to really all pay him. So he forgave him the debt. The same servant that was forgiven, that servant went and found another fellow servant, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, literally, physically, saying, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and brought him and had said, and besought him. And he said, have patience with me and I'll pay you what I owe you. But he would not. And he went and cast him into prison till he would pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were so sorry and came and told their master, their Lord, the owner. They went and told him what happened. Then the Lord, after he heard this, he said, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you asked me, you desired, you, you asked me if I would. Should you not have also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had on you? And this Lord, this master, he was wroth, he was angry, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your, what's next? Heart, forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Wow. He said you owed him that huge debt. You for, forgave. You were forgiven for the huge debt. But you get somebody who owed you very little. And you said, I'm taking you by the throat. I'm going to throw you in prison till you pay it all. So the master says, you wicked servant. He was a servant. Maybe a church going folk. He was a servant. You were wicked. Unforgiveness is wicked in the eyes of God. You wicked servant, you shouldn't have done that. And then they said, take him and put him into the tormentors, prison tormentors, until he comes to the place. Really, what he's doing is he's saying, put him into the tormentors until you, you must forgive from your heart. Put him in the tormentors till everything has been paid. Then he goes on to say, likewise, he says, to everyone else, he said, you must forgive from your hearts everyone his brother their trespasses. What are the tormentors? The best I understand, the tormentors are things like bitterness and worry and anger and depression, fear. These are tormentors that God allows in our lives to bring us to repentance. That we come to the place of saying, oh God, I can't go on like this anymore. I have fear, depression, worry, uh, discouragement, all of these things. God is saying, is there somebody you need to forgive? Have you forgotten? Tormentors, things that torment us and don't allow us, doesn't allow us to have peace in our heart when there's unforgiveness. He said, put him to the tormentors until he's ready to forgive. Tormentors, some we should look at a little more. It's like, what are those tormentors and how do, those, how do those tormentors work? But then he, Peter was saying seven or 70 times seven, 490. Jesus was not saying once it's 490, then you don't have to anymore. But he's really saying you must forgive as often as is necessary because that's what Jesus does for you and for me. He forgives us. This, this, this illustration is also an illustration of Jesus Christ on the cross for you and for me. Paying a price that we could never pay. He paid a debt we couldn't pay. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He paid it for you and for me. But the magnitude of sin when Jesus went to the cross to give his life. Something that we could not pay. We could not go to the cross and be crucified. Even our blood would not suffice because it was not royal blood from heaven. But Jesus, the spotless lamb that died for us. And who wants people to see, to see here, the magnitude is saying, I forgive. So what he's saying here, Jesus also, he's saying, how could we that have been forgiven for our sins hold out on someone else that has wronged us? Have you not been looking at the cross, Jesus is saying? Have we taken our eyes off of the cross? I forgave you all that sin. 
I forgave you everything of your life and your past. I forgave you. I washed in the blood. And you're saying you're not going to forgive somebody that did something to you here? That's what he's saying here. We got to look at Jesus. Look at the cross. In order to really truly forgive, 26 times in the New Testament, it talks about forgiveness. 23 times it says for us to forgive others. 23 at different times. And uh, there's some sayings. I, wanna, I just want to read this. Um, forgiveness is better than revenge, for forgiveness is the sign of a gentle nature, but revenge is the sign of a savage nature. If you are suffering from a bad man's injustice, forgive him lest there be two bad men. Forgiveness is like dimming our headlights. It happens sooner when we take the initiative. Over in Africa, these guys drive at night, keep their headlights on bright, and they just keep them on. And I say, Zed, put them on dim. He said, oh, I will let him. I said, no, 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 no. No, they're playing the game. <laughs> and he played the game. Don't put your hand up. Anyhow. Oh. I said, no, no, no. You teach him by doing it first, and that will teach him that is how you do it. Amen, church. And then, after a vigorous brotherly and sisterly disagreement, our three children retired only to be aroused at 2 a.m. in the morning by a terrific thunderstorm, lightning. Hearing an unusual noise upstairs, I called to find out what was going on. A little voice answered, We are all in the closet forgiving each other. <laughs> I remember a little Amish boy, when I was 11 years old, and I was on the farm watching cattle. Didn't have any fencing there. And I was watching cattle in, in an afternoon, and, and all of a sudden there was a hand that came on. A hand came down, and a hand touched me. And said, Nelson. And I'd have a habit of falling asleep watching the cows. And, and Nelson. And I looked up and I saw a white hand. And it went away. I remember running down the hill to the barn. And there I saw my mother and her sister. My sister had come for the day for canning and stuff and sort of, and mom and her sister were in an argument something had happened they didn't agree with and uh, my aunt my mother's sister was packing up the buggy ready to leave and said yeah well we're just going to leave and i was standing there and then i said uh, hey i just saw something i i said uh, i was up on the hill and this hand came and and it touched me as a what i i sleeping and i well, it was a white hand, and oh, what else? Anything else? Say anything. I said, just my name. Was there anything else? They got worried, and all of a sudden, one of them, my mom or my sister, her sister said, I think we better forgive each other. It could be the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know what? Maybe there's more truth to that than we think. We better forgive each other. The end is going to come soon. They forgave each other and peace was made. And I still don't know, Paul, Dave. I still, still don't know what God was doing with the white hand. But it was so real. It was so real. The Amish bishop, while we're talking about Amish, the Amish bishop, he left church one day, and he, he came out and to hitch up his horse, and there were all these stones in the buggy box. And some young men had thrown these big stones in there because there's something they didn't care, didn't like about the bishop. So the way to get even with him, load his buggy down with stones because somebody's going somebody's gonna to have to throw them out. He goes out, and he looks, and he sees them, and he just takes them, and just, he just throws them out, and... Goes home 20 years later. Some men that were now married men came to the bishop's house. And they said, Bishop, want to talk? Yeah? Yeah, Bishop, you remember. Back there, a number of years ago now, 
Well, those stones that were put in, that was us three guys. And we just, it's bothered us. And we just came to say we're sorry that we did that. Can you forgive us? He said, oh, he said, wow, you've been carrying them stones. I forgave you a long time ago, but you've been carrying them stones for 20 years, seems like. They were carrying the weight of something they'd done wrong all those years, worrying them. Every time they'd see the bishop, like, ah, oh, one day we got to tell him, you know, does he know it's us? I wonder if he knows it's us, you know. You know what? How many people sit here tonight that are carrying stones of unforgiveness? It's getting heavier, heavier, heavier as years go by. People you'd rather not see because of things that were done that were not proper. Maybe those people don't know even uh, who it was. Um, we're more like beasts when we kill. We're most like men when we judge. We're most like God when we forgive. What about us here this evening? A Turkish soldier had beaten a Christian prisoner till he was only half conscious. And while it was kicking him, he demanded of him, What can your Christ do for you now? The Christian quietly replied, He can give me strength to forgive you. He can give me strength to forgive you. What about us here today? Uh, there's going to be conflict, no matter what. You know, Walter Lippmann, I see all the married couples out here. And it was Walter Lippmann who said, the possibility of two people living together for 25 years without a serious quarrel is a quality only to be admired in sheep. <laughs> Except for Dave and Ruth Ann Miller. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> Only in sheep. Because the possibility is there for every one of us. We're in relationships at church, in the family, in the work, wherever it may be. The possibility is of relationships becoming torn and strained and, and ruined and so forth. And uh, the possibility is there because we still are red blood Americans. And we're not perfect yet. We're not perfect. But yet... If, it's, if, if we're not under the power of the Holy Spirit and not quick to forgive, you see, those things that can happen so, so, so quickly. And uh, just uh, so many, I mean, even people sitting, you're sitting here this evening, things that you are facing, is things that you've, Jesus Christ was the greatest example of somebody being ridiculed and rejected and tormented and slapped in the face and spit and all these things that had done to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that were against him. But yet there from the cross, he uttered those words. What was it in Luke chapter 20, uh, 23, verse 34, somewhere in there, where Jesus said those words where he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Sometimes people hurt us and they don't know. They don't understand how they're hurting us. Sometimes we hurt other people and they don't know. We don't know how we hurt them. And so forth. And then if somebody said, hurting people hurt other people. But to be willing to make things right and to get a look at Jesus, think so much we have to look at what Jesus went through and what he faced. When Jesus was ridiculed, rejected, insulted, humiliated. He was forsaken by his own, misunderstood, betrayed by his friends, verbally abused, physically abused. Nails in hands and feet, crown of thorns upon his head, the spear in his sight. His heart was smitten, his heart was broken. All of those things, some we can identify with. Some forms of abuses, because there are many. But some we cannot. But part of it's a part of life of things that you and I, things that we go through. Forgiveness brings healing to the soul, to the mind, to the will, and to the emotions. Unforgiveness makes us a prisoner to those that we don't want to forgive. Actually, is what it does. And it puts us in a debtor's prison when we're not willing uh, to forgive others uh, in that way. I jotted down some of the uh, things concerning situations of people going through, you know, verbal abuse. Probably one of the most hurtful, what's the scripture there in Proverbs 18, 21? Death and life 
are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat the fruit thereby, or eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I don't know how many people here tonight, you know, the word, uh, the word malice, the Bible talks about bitterness. It says, let all bitterness, anger, clamor, evil speaking, all be put away from us. Let it all be put away and be kind and tenderhearted one to another, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So forgive one another. Well, we have a tutor. Anyhow. Yeah. If somebody's saying, it sounds like your horn. Are you serious? So how many of you come from a different church? <laughs> I was going to see how many hands go up. Anyhow. All right. Let's get back on track. But when there are words that are used and so forth, and you say tonight, words like, you are dumb, you are crazy, you are stupid. Uh, I thought I'd talk about uh, somebody saying, you're a failure. But God does not make failures. We fail, but we are not a failure. You can't do anything right. You're weird. You're crazy. You're a mistake. These words are words that hurt. And sometimes in growing up, there's things that happen like that. where Words are used. Somebody said, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Words hurt. Words cut deep when words are spoken. What kind of words have been spoken to you or words that you would speak to other people that are damaging, that are hurtful. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, bitterness, anger that has gone underground and poisons the mind and the heart. Wrath and anger, an intense emotion that often causes me to act irrational, destructive, and sinful. Clamor, a noisy complaining that intends to distract and destroy and bring attention to me and my ideas and hurts. Malice, the inner urge to harm another person with my words and actions. While I enjoy the pain I cause to another person. Some of you have been maliced. Somebody has spoken things that have meant to hurt and to harm you. So I want to say this, and I mean it to hurt you. That is a sin in the eyes of the Lord. And it hurts very, very deeply. And then you believe the lie. You're stupid. You're crazy. You're not worth anything. You're a failure. And then the enemy comes and says, you hear that? That's who you really are. And if you believe that lie, that's when a stronghold enters our hearts. And we cannot have anymore. The joy of the Lord is not our strength anymore. We start believing the lies. And the only way to come against that, first of all, we've got to say, who said that? Did God, would God ever say, you're stupid, you're crazy, you're a jerk, you're a no good for nothing, you are dumb? Will God say that to you? Hello? No. The devil will do it and he'll use people to do it. But God will never say that. he say, I love you, I care about you, you're love you, you're beautiful, I created you in my image, I want you for myself. He speaks words of love and affirmation to us. That's when we have to take authority over that and say, who said that? That's from the enemy. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5, it says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds to bring every thought, everything into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. He said everything... Say, Lord, where is this from? And if it's not from the Lord, say, I will not receive this. This is not from God. But if somebody says those things to you, to say, Lord, I choose to forgive them. It's like Jesus from the cross. They know not what they do. Father, would you forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. Titus, I believe that the Father, that Jesus wanted to see them in heaven with him. Or else he would have not said, Father, forgive them. Because when he said, Father, forgive them, it meant they were forgiven so that they could go to heaven. Just like a thief on the cross beside him. When he said, today you can be with me in paradise to the glory of God. He had others on his mind. He was forgiving them. He forgave that thief. While he had nails in his hands and feet, he forgave him. What about us? Words that are spoken. For some of us, for some tonight, that's a very painful subject. Because you think of a mother or a father or a grandma or a grandma or a grandpa 
or somebody that very unkind words. When you see that person, it, it does something inside. It hurts. It's painful. If you sit here tonight and you use words like that, uh, friend, towards your children, please, I beg of you, ask God to give you grace and help to change the vocabulary and to say, I want to call them for who they are and say their name and be kind, be loving toward them. Well, that's the way my dad did. Ho, ho, ho. That's where the power of God breaks the generational curses. Right there. That's not the way Jesus does it. Jesus said, speak words of love, speak words of kindness, treat them well, encourage them. Because say, that's the way so-and-so did it. Don't ever use that as an excuse. If it is not biblical, let the power of God through the Holy Spirit come through and say, Lord, help me to do what is right by the power of God. Amen. Amen. To the glory of God. Start a new generation. Start a new. And say, from now on, with God's help, we want to do it this way. Help us, Jesus, to do it right. Do it in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Physical abuse. It's a subject we don't really don't want to talk about. But being abused physically. I spoke about it last evening with my dad and, and how that dad would grab something nearby and wherever it was and a strap or something when this went wrong or that and just like, okay, a stick off of a tree, you know, if you a weeping willow tree or whatever, boom, wham, wham, wham. And we were like, no, no, it wasn't me. No, 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 it wasn't right. That was my brother so far. Didn't matter. You're both just going to get it. Maybe it was one or the other, but you'll just both, you know, cause such anger and bitterness in my heart. I don't like you, Dad. That wasn't fair. Couldn't we have talked? Could we just have talked about it first? But at that point, Dad was not a talker. There was anger that had come in. And you were like... This is not fair. And I shared the story last evening. And of how when my, when I later was 18, leaving home, a heart filled with anger and, and rebellion. And I shared about going. And then when I came to know Christ as my Savior, to go back to my dad. And the Lord enabled us by His grace to make peace so that I could say to my daddy, Daddy, I was sorry. I was wrong for what I did and the way I treated you, Dad. And my daddy said, I forgive you. I said, can you forgive me? And then my daddy said, Nelson, I was wrong. I didn't treat you boys the way I should have. And I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? And I said, Dad, I forgive you. I forgive you. And we hugged each other. And the very first time ever, I said to my daddy, I said, I love you. I was 25 years old. I said, I love you. First time ever, my daddy said, I love you too. From that point on, as about 46 years ago, that point on, we keep hugging each other and telling each other we love one another. There's things that dad quit doing and there's things happened to both of our, uh, both of our lives. But just to embrace him and show him love, and today I was thinking about it that, you know, I have 11 siblings, had 11 siblings. Now three brothers have gone home. One just months ago of cancer in his throat, my younger brother. They're all younger than me. But it seemed like when I started hugging dad and hugging mom, it seemed like some of the other siblings, they were like, oh, that must be okay. So they started hugging dad and hugging mom. And I just saw everybody open up more. I want to ask you tonight if you would be an initiator in your household, your generation. Be an initiator of building relationships. God is looking for initiators who will do that. Peacemakers. And that's what God did through Jesus Christ. He initiated for you and for me. There at the cross. Last, last week when I was in Africa, I was sharing there and I talked about, about spanking. Because it's really grieved me when I see these people and I see them with their take sticks, anything they have. And they'll, they'll grab something and they'll just smack the child. They'll, they'll take a stick and they will just like anywhere like boom, 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 boom. Boom, it doesn't matter where. And the child is crying, the child's running. It can't outrun the mother. So the mother catches up and just whips it again. And my heart is absolutely crushed. 
Their generations have all done it that way. So when I see that, even if we're in a medical clinic, I'll stop everything. And I'll share a little lesson. But this was in a seminar last week where I was sharing there with a number of mothers and fathers. And I said, when you discipline, I gave the story of my dad. And I said, when you discipline, I said, you take them. And I gave, them the, I gave them this illustration because my daughter Carolyn, our daughter Carolyn was there, our second born that I was sharing about last night. And so I gave the story about Carolyn, when she's about nine years old. And we were living there in Goshen. Anyhow, and then, and then Sarah had made some kind of soup or whatever, and I overheard. So she said, no, I don't want to eat that soup. And I heard Sarah say again, this is happening for supper. No, I don't want to eat that soup. And I heard it the third time. And about third time, I thought, okay, it's time that Daddy comes and pays attention to what's going on. So I take Carol and I go to the bedroom. I'm telling the people in Africa this. Carol's sitting there listening. As I'm telling this, she just smiling. She knows what's coming. Anyhow. So I go to the bedroom and I'm and I sat there and I said, then I go and I, I take her there. And I, and I tried to explain to them, I did this privately. If you're going to discipline, do it privately. Don't do it where others can see. That is demeaning to a child. Even in front of siblings. Take them privately. I took her privately, and then I'm like, honey, you know, you weren't listening to mama, and she wanted you to eat, and it's good soup, and she's crying, and... And, honey, you know what I have to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to spank you. I need to. And, you know, yeah, like, you know, it hurts me as much as it does you. You know, that kind of thing, anyhow. And I said, you know, I don't want to do this. And then I'm starting to cry because she's crying, you know. And uh, some of us dads had little girls, you know. It's probably me more so than boys. I don't know. Maybe like him right there. So, anyhow. And so I'm saying, but I have to do this. And she's like, oh, Dad, I'll eat any kind of soup you want me to eat. I said, I know you will, but it's too late. <laughs> so I just had to go, you know, with the stick. Don't use your hand. So they don't despise the hand. They despise the stick, okay? Yeah, blam, 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 blam. She's crying. But then when she gets, and then I'll go and I said, honey, I love you. I love you too, daddy. I was just, you know, that's part of the, the mess being made a miracle turning into ministry that you can share with others. Here's what I used to do, but here's how God has taught me to do it. Just, just let ministry start happening from our lives. Not in, a, not in a way that, you know, makes people feel bad, but just to say, this is something maybe you want to consider and think about. Because you you're thinking about the children and, you know, things that they go through. But I just want to just, just share that this evening, that, you know, when it comes to physical fathers... Be careful how you discipline your children. I remember in one of the meetings, Abe noticed this well, but one of the meetings, somebody, they came and there was a man and he's at the altar and he's praying and he's broken. I go down and say, what's wrong? He said, oh, Nelson, he said, he said, I have been so bad to my boys. He said, I took my boys and I actually put them up against the pole and I wrapped a rope around them and then I took a twitch, a big switch, and I just beat them and I beat them. And they couldn't move. But that was my way of discipline because that's the way my daddy always did us. I said, oh, my Lord. But he said, now the boys are running away. Any wonder? They're running away and they hate me and so forth. And then I can share to him, you know, have you ever forgiven? Have you forgiven your father for what he's done to you? No, he's dead. But I said, still, have you forgiven your father? No. Are you willing to forgive your father for the way he treated you? And after a little while, he said, I didn't think about it that way. But I said, if you forgive, then the Lord is able to forgive you, and the chain is broken when you're willing to do that. And then he did. That's about forgive, and went back to his boys, and God has done a beautiful, has done a beautiful work. I just want to say, take steps to understand. If you need to forgive, some of you may be 50, 60, 70 years old, and just something that you remember about your father, I didn't like to that, or your mother, this is what she did. Forgive, forgive. Say, Lord, I choose to forgive. I don't want that past to hang on to me because I can't move forward when I'm holding on to the past. We will not move forward. We will not be into greater works. We will not be into more fruitfulness if we hold on to the past. We've got to let go. Paul said, this one thing I do, I forget that which is behind and I press forward toward the high calling on the mark in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And Paul could have said, the murderer, I was a murderer. I did all this. He was. But the Lord brought him past that. By the grace of God, 
about you tonight, and abuse, and physical, and, in, and even your families, children, parents. If there's things God is revealing to you, where you need to say, I'm sorry, fathers, us fathers need to lead the way in our home. Somebody needs to be the peace, the initiator, but to be able to say words like, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Can you forgive me? I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Not say, I hope you can forgive me, move on. No, no, always make it a question because you want an answer. I'm sorry. For us men, those three words come very hard. And I was wrong. Can you forgive me? I need forgiveness. Can you forgive me? To hear somebody say, yes. That is so beautiful. So beautiful. And if there's something they've done wrong, let them take care of that. Instead of you reminding them. Remember last night? I didn't tell my dad. Now, dad, you know what you did to us. But when I was done asking him for forgiveness, he went on to say, I need, I need forgiveness. Can you forgive me? That was so beautiful. So beautiful. So take initiative. Take initiative. Things that need to change, change it. And uh, by, the, by the grace of God. Um, Leaders, even I had jotted down, even leaders, leaders in churches and ministries and so forth. Uh, when we are peacemakers and forgivers, the followers and those around us are more apt to do the same thing. When they see that we forgive and we're quick to forgive, Jesus said to Matthew 5 5 9, He said, Blessed are the peacemakers because they shall be called the children of God. How many of you want to be a child of God? You know, a child of God where God says, That's my child. Come on, get your hand up. Yeah. Then it, they, if we are, we're going to need to be peacemakers. We have to be peacemakers. Said, you that are peacemakers, you are a child of God. You're one of mine. You're a peacemaker. Go to all ends to be a peacemaker. And then the, um, the others for, in uh, forgiveness. Um, only verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. My sweetheart, last week in Uganda, um, she there at the women's conference was sharing with the ladies what she went through as a little, as a nine-year-old. And how that for 25 years she told no one. It was a friend, family member. That is so often what's happening. Some have come since we've been here with just broken hearts. Things in family. And some is so, is so heartbreaking. You don't know how to pray. Where to start? As a 16 year old in the factory to help my dad, a young Amish boy, never been away from the farm, hardly at all, and help him support the family. And a man says, You go home with me at lunchtime from one of the plain churches. Uh, okay. Went home. But the man had wrong intentions. And I hated him. I hated him. I became a Christian. Uh, some of that is what helped drive me to alcohol, drugs, and just bitterness and anger, just running away from anything church. But when he became a Christian, he was on my list because I was so angry at him, but I forgave him. I said, God, I forgive him. He wounded my heart, but it didn't wound my body. I choose to forgive him, and God gave me grace to do that. I went to this man, this is very sad, I went to this man. Because there's one of the people that I said, God, I don't know when I'm ever going to see him. God said, I'll set it up. He did. I went to a church where we ministered at on a Sunday. And there he was. And in the basement alone, I pulled him aside. This is very sad. And I said to him, remember? Place. Oh, yeah. I said, made me very angry and bitter at you. I hated you. But Jesus has come in my heart. 
He has forgiven me for all my sins. And I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you. And he said, oh, it's just nothing. It's just, hey, it happens. Everybody's doing it. And that was it. And I walked away. Because unforgiveness has an eternal attach, attached to it. If you forgive not people their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. That's how serious it is. It has eternal uh, consequences that are attached to it. Can we forgive? Tonight God is to some of you here this evening to willing just to come and forgive. There's we have so many illustrations this is gonna bring, but you had that photo. Uh, this was two weeks ago yesterday in Africa. It made a little cross. It has six nails, three on each side. Cross is about this high. Wood like this, and then a piece like this, and here's nails coming out. And all these people had a piece of paper. Some couldn't read or write at all. But we shared just like we're sharing now. People were crying. There's so much hurt and pain. Some from years ago, physical, verbal, sexual, terrible abuses. They don't know how to love. I said, just write on the paper what it is. Who are you forgiving? What are you bringing to the cross of Jesus? And then you come and you just stick the paper in the nails. Wish you could have seen what happened. That's my grandson, 14 years old, standing there holding the cross because so much paper was going in that there was not room anymore for papers, hardly. Children that were seven, eight years old were reaching up, sticking papers in there. People that couldn't read or write, I said, just hold your paper and tell Jesus what it is, who it is, and then bring it up and put it in. And I imagine 300 people, they just kept coming and coming and would put papers and they'd stand there, sometimes put the paper, and they were thinking about what they just had done, and then walk back. We had prayer together. We don't have a cross here this evening like that. But tonight, I believe there's a lot of peacemakers in this place. People sitting here tonight that have new vision of what it means to be a peacemaker and have peace with God, peace with others, and, and even the hurts and the pain. To Number one, we acknowledge it to God and say, God, this is really painful. Jesus, this is so painful. You were there when it happened. And forgiveness, there are so many verses that we could have used on forgiveness. You know, forgive us. Uh, and uh, and how we are to forgive others. But maybe tonight, whether it's in your family, in your marriage, your home, your church, your business, Whatever it may be, but God is bringing people to your mind, to your heart, where there needs to be reconciliation. For some, it's very, very hard. It's painful, very painful. But if you be an initiator and say, Jesus, I'm going to do my part. I just want to come and say, Jesus, I choose to forgive. Could have been years ago. But let Jesus bring freedom to your spirit.
We're just saying, Jesus, I'm coming and I want to pray. And also, if you, if you know conditions, if you know situations where right now the relationships are tattered and torn, they're not well, and you want to pray for those people. You want to intercede for those people and bring them to the throne of grace. And you say, Jesus, I am praying for this couple or this single person, this individual, this family. I am praying, Lord, things are not well. And I am interceding on their behalf to restore relationships, God, that they can experience peace. The peace of God, peace with one another, and experience what God has created us to experience. That we can do that. And come and intercede. You don't need a counselor to pray with you for that. You can come and God's laying people on your heart. Or if there's in your own heart, you just say, God is speaking to me. I just... There's steps I need. There's something about coming and kneeling. There's something about it called it stickability that when we come before the Lord in seriousness in that way, it helps us to go away with greater strength and courage and faith to say, I want to walk out what God has put in me. I want to walk forward to do that. I want to go from here to put that into practice, whatever it is. Let's stand together.